Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's my pleasure to be in Pasadena. I see my son-in-law here, and uh, I'm here very often. I live in Toronto, and the reason I'm here very often is not because of my daughter or my son-in-law, but my two beautiful granddaughters who are five and three. And you might have difficult questions, but my granddaughter, Abby, not long time ago, asked me a very difficult question. He asked, she asked me, who is God? Yeah. Try to answer that. So uh, I want to talk to you about scaling. And I do understand that most of you are not worried about it yet. You are struggling. You have an idea. You have an app of how to, uh, how to beat uh, Amazon. You, you, have a, uh, you have an app of how to make a developer or an app, uh, work harder and be more efficient and how to measure what those crazy guys tell you and how to, because you really can believe them and trust them. And, but if you are successful, you will get to a point where you'll have to move from a bunch of guys, usually guys, sorry, doing stuff to a real company, to a real business. And the question is, how do you do that? So I, I've been in the high tech uh, business before we called it high tech, maybe 40 years, and did every single job there. CTO and VP of engineering. The last five years, I reinvented myself as a, as a consultant and a coach. Being a coach is what I really like. I do due diligence for venture capital firms and write reports for them, but I really like to work with leaders, most of them very young, most of them inexperienced. And I, I, I coach in, a, in one company, I coach three levels of management where every single one of them is doing the job for the first time in their life. So how do you do that? So I, um, the first question is, what does scaling mean? And I don't refer to the dental procedure to treat your gums. But what, 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 does, it, uh, what does growth mean? So you have a small company. Uh, and it can be a technology company, but not necessarily. You have a pizza joint. It is very successful, and you want to grow it. You, uh, I, I, for quite a while, I've been using the, the term technology-driven companies, but I stopped using it because I think every single company is technology-driven. Uh, and, and if you like it or not, if you are an innovator, if you have something, you, you'll have something to do with technology. And I think that w one of the beautiful things that happened maybe in the last 10, 15 years, that a lot of people came into this field from other areas. You see a lot of uh, English grads that develop apps. Uh, you see a lot of, and that did a lot of good to people like me who are square engineers that always thought about the technical solution to every problem. And you got those innovative, creative guys and, and women that didn't know that some things are not possible and made them happen. So a lot of good stuff came in. But is it a lot of baggage uh, in the sense that people did, do, didn't or don't have deep knowledge of technology? They took a boot camp course, uh, and they learned uh, years ago HTML, and then PHP, and things like that. And they can deliver an application. And the barrier to entry is very small. Um, so a typical scenario is where you have Somebody who three years ago was a programmer in a small company of three people struggling to come up with something. They developed an application that some people somewhere are interested. Uh, suddenly, they have investment. And now, the same person who was somewhat a developer, or maybe a fantastic developer, is managing a group of 200 people. Because investors told him, grow, 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 grow fast. Grow, grow, grow fast, hire people. So what does scaling mean? Does scaling mean only size? Somebody told me yesterday, hey, our company is 350 people. We're one year old. And in a year, we'll have 1,000 people. Is that scaling? Is that scale? It's scaling um, uh, uh, depend on size? Does it depend on maturity of how you do business? Does it have to be profitable? And we know about some big companies that grow like crazy, but are still not profitable. That, what comes to mind is Uber, for example. Think about that. Fantastic company, even though my Uber uh, 
Rai didn't show up today, but usually it works. <laughs> Usually, and, and the guy blamed on technology, which I knew he was lying. But, <laughs> uh, but you, 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 what does scale mean? How you do that? And why is technology so different, or is it different than other businesses? How is it different? And and I have a few uh, ideas. Why is it different? Uh, but really. Uh, I think the same rules apply to everything. I think what we have is technology is ability to grow very fast. The barrier to entry are, are very small. Somebody can have an idea about beating Amazon, and maybe we think it's a joke today, but three years from now, he might be the new Amazon. We don't know. The barrier to entry are very, are very low because all you need is a laptop. Uh, can even use a used laptop. Uh, you deployment is. Is, is very easy today. You can rent that. You, cannot, you don't need to buy servers and things like that. And so I'll, I'll try to, to answer some of those questions and raise other questions for you. Um, so here are some of the questions that, that, that one uh, can ask about scaling. So one concept is scaling up or scaling out, and that's a systems uh, uh, question. And uh, in the email introducing uh, this talk, uh, Mike gave the example of a burrito bag, which is small, and now it's big. So that's an example of scaling up, uh, which means you, let's say from an organization point of view, you have somebody managing two people, so they manage four people, they manage six people, they manage 12 people, they manage 24 people. And that's a scaling up. And scaling out, OK, we have several systems. And they're all small and inexpensive, and you can add more and more systems. And sometimes it works. Other times, the communication needed between those systems is so complex that it makes it very difficult. An interesting part, it applies to systems, but it applies to human beings as well. You know, people came up with all kinds of rules of thumb. OK, you should manage more than seven people, because this is when you're optimal. So you create more and more seven people groups and how we do it. So that's the difference between scale up and scale out. Uh, generally, most people do a scale out uh, uh, today with a little bit of up. When do you start scaling? So I look around here, and I talk to a few people, and you, 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 you have a small company. Maybe it's you and your brother-in-law doing some stuff. Should you think about scaling? Hmm, probably not. Probably not. So I've seen. Rare, it's seen rarely, but I've seen a few cases where people with incredible funding try to build an infrastructure right from day one. To me, that's a premature scaling. Don't worry about that. Get the initial uh, acceptance. Uh, what is a good growth rate? You know, you, you, you look at some companies, and I, I know a lot of you would say, I wish I had this problem, but suddenly have a lot of funding, uh, great investors, and hire like crazy, hire lots and lots of people, and deploy geographically into many locations. And sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. We, we, we see the facade of those companies, and you think that, wow, I wish I could be like them. But you don't see the kitchen. You don't see what's happening in the background. And you don't see the, 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 the mistake. The other issue that uh, I'm going to try and talk about it if we have time is organizational architecture. How should you get organized? How should you get organized to, for optimal success? And, and what are the attributes that you are looking for? Autonomy, um, um, yeah, interaction between people, span of control, self-managed team, and so on. What about your processes? Obviously, when you have a few people in the company, maybe under 20, maybe five, uh, you don't need a lot of processes. Everybody knows everything. Everybody knows what everybody else is doing. Everybody is involved in every single decision. As you grow bigger, obviously, you have to look at uh, what do you do. How do you develop uh, software, which a lot of people here do, but it doesn't, uh, if you develop software or you, you develop a marketing campaign or a visual, you still um, have to think about, okay, how do we do things? And how do you do it? Uh, deliberately. I like this uh, acronym MVB, which I think um, 
uh, Spotify invented, which is, okay, what is the minimum? How do you, how do you prevent, how do you avoid moving from this informal, enthusiastic, passionate group to, to this big bureaucracy, but every decision is difficult, and, and you have a lot of people whose only job in life is to say no to something. How do you avoid that? And, and, and some of you maybe work for a big company and experience that, and now they're entrepreneurs and say, I don't never my company to be like that. But I've seen people going through the same cycle, leaving a big company, having a startup, and a few years later, they have exactly the same organization as their previous company. Because you have to, you, 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 you have to find the balance. And actually, I'm not crazy about the word balance, and I used to say that balance is an euphemism for mediocrity. And, 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 it's, and it's very difficult to get passionate about balance. You know? um, the other big, big question, and, and, and what's happening to the team? And when I say, you, do you develop existing team members or hire experience? Or you yourselves, if you are a founder of a company, do you decide, OK, I was great at taking the company to this point or being a head of engineering this point, but from now on, this is not my thing. I don't enjoy that. I'm not good at that. And make a decision. Do I want to learn to, to manage a group of 200 or 500 people, or I want to go back uh, stay with some company and do a, a, a different role or start a new one because that's my thing. This is what I like to do. But if you are the CEO of a company or the major investor and are a decision maker or an influencer, you have to make those decisions. How much do you invest in the people you have? Who do you invest in? And when do you bring in experience? Um, so... Um, when I look at a, at a group uh, and at a company, and I've done quite a few due diligence uh, projects for uh, venture capital firms, and when I came in as, a, as an executive myself, uh, I really looked at the four pillars of the organization, and those are people, technology, processes, and projects. And I'll talk a little bit more about it, but... Uh, basically, I think this, this covers, and, 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 and I think when you, uh, obviously, when you have two people, it's one thing. But when you, when you look, you, you, you grow bigger, you have to decide, okay, what's happening to me in all those areas? And where do I want to get to? Do, uh, so when you talk about people, you talk about talent, experience, culture, leadership and absorbing, absorption capacity. And that's a very, very important thing. And I've seen things fail because uh, the team doubled. Uh, the experienced and knowledgeable people were very busy, and we slowed everybody down. And what's optimal? How, how do you do that? You add as many people as you can, and when you see problems, you slow down a little bit, or you will control that growth. Technology is also very important. And, and one of, the, uh, one of the issues with uh, technology is um, that people have to be careful with is jumping into the latest fad. Oh, we have a new framework for this. We have a new technology of a new language. OK, so-and-so read an article, downloaded uh, a piece of software, wrote a simple uh, application, and says, oh, we should all move to that. And then everybody moves to that. Or you have complete freedom, and every single group in your organization can use any technology they want, which is wonderful. It's wonderful because it gives people a chance to learn, but it's extremely difficult to manage. Um, technical debt, and those of you who are in software development or interact with software development know about that. Um, I, I'll be frank with you. If I see a, a, a new company in the startup after startup in the growth phase, and they don't have technical debt, I'm very worried. Because that tells me they didn't run fast enough, they didn't get to the user fast enough, and they spent too much time developing the optimal thing. So some of the, techni some of the applications that have technical debt um, uh, might, might be a complete disaster, which you cannot recover from. But taking shortcuts when you are small, when you try to survive and try to be there is the right thing to do. Because if you don't do that, you're not going to be around to fix it. And then it, nothing else matters. Uh, 
process is also a big thing. And those of you in software development, and in fact, some of those processes apply to every field, are, 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 are very interesting. Are very interesting because um, uh, I would say in the last 10, 15 years, people switch to doing things in an agile way. And, and there's a lot of definition of agile. Uh, some people misinterpret it. Well, we are agile, so I don't have to document anything. I don't have to design anything. I just go over and write a bit of code. And if, if it seems to work sometime for some people, that's good enough. Obviously, you want to do uh, more than that. Autonomy is, is, is also wonderful. And it works very well in in an optimal environment. It works well when you, you have a group of people that work, have a long history of working together, that are experienced, uh, that are single-minded, that have the same objective, and then it works wonderful. Most of the time, uh, it's, the situation is not uh, optimal. Um, projects, again, that's, that's quite simple. Uh, at any point in time, one has to know what are the projects that are important and find a way to prioritize them based on value. That's easier, uh, easier said, said than done, because how do you measure value? As you grow, you have more people in the company who have different uh, perspective of what's value. Um, the, the combination of agility and knowing the project gives you the ability to pivot and, and, and change. And if you are able to do that, that's wonderful. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about uh, people. So what, what, what I like to do is, uh, uh, you'll see a theme here, and you'll understand that how people is the most important thing in all this. Um, uh, an assessment of who is your team, and uh, what's their experience, knowledge, personality, and experience. Very, very difficult to be honest and self-aware about that. And I, uh, I've seen some people uh, that are, are really good at that. Um, interesting enough, I work with a lot of young people. So the CTOs I work with are in their early 30s. And, and uh, I'm very optimistic and encouraged when I work with them because so many of them are self-aware and they, are se they seek help and they know what they don't know. So they're wiser, I think they're wiser today than we're uh, the engineers in my, when I was a young engineer, uh, our generation was. Um, uh, the other is, what is organization? Obviously, when you start, you're a flat organization, but what do you, what, what do you, how do you move forward? What kind of organization uh, do you want? There is a term called full stack engineers, which some of you might be familiar, which is generalist, they can do everything. And that's wonderful, that is wonderful. But occasionally, you need specialized people. So if you don't have specialization by platform or by area, by you need a database specialist and so on, you're not going to get the same result. Also, people are, don't necessarily like to be full stack engineers. They don't necessarily want to work in, in all areas. Some people are more inclined towards user interface, and others are, uh, don't have this aesthetic uh, ability, um, and what's the growth capacity? I'm coming back to the growth capacity because I've seen it again and again, and some of my clients really went through incredible growth, and they have a board meeting, and the CEO reports, well, we increased our engineering uh, team from 10 to 50, and everybody says, well, wonderful, keep going, keep going, keep going, and very few people look behind the scene to say, okay, what? What happened? Did we increase our, our output? And uh, the last one on this slide is a leadership team. Okay. Are the leader capable of handling? And you see small companies, somebody who was a programmer three years ago and is now the CTO, and now he or she are engaged in, 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 in acquisitions and have other teams that, uh, uh, new teams they have to supervise. And it's a, it's a real challenge, and uh, most of us have a hard time uh, hand, um, um, uh, handling that. Uh, we have a few exceptional people that are, were able to, trans to transition from all the phases. Somebody like Bill 
Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and things like that, but most of us really have a hard time being good at all phases of a company. Um, so, um, I will, uh, what's the next one? Okay, as far as technology, the thing I like to look at is what is the real architecture uh, of a product? And you know, if you, if you are an, an investor and you go and the head of engineering, the CTO presents to you uh, a, a chart with their architecture, what you see that the, the circles are very round and the, the, the rectangles are very square and there is one arrow going from one to another and it's beautiful. Very rarely that's the truth. And um, what I tell people uh, is, uh, okay, you present it to investors, you have investment now, now stop smoking what you're selling, okay? <laughs> Understand where you are and really work with that. So again, the, the circles uh, uh, are not very round and the, the rectangles are not very square and that's okay because you did it to get here. Now your system works. But if I ask you about scale, don't tell me, well, our system can scale to any size because it's designed for that. Well, if it was really designed for that, I would be again very disappointed because you didn't get here fast enough. So you have to be honest about that. Uh, what platforms and frameworks are you using? Are you using something that has been in the market for at least a year? N somebody else try it. And, I, and, and I'm, I, I try very hard not to be too conservative on that, but your innovation is not the latest fad in, uh, in, in technology. What tools and systems are you using, okay? So uh, things like, things you didn't think about it, uh, performance management, uh, load test. Uh, do you know when your system breaks and how it behaves when it breaks? Did you ever run a test that broke your system? Uh, your CEO promised the world that you are going to double the number of users next year, or maybe 10 times. Did you understand what, what are the traffic implications on your system? Or you are going to get there and one day it's going to crash. Sometimes you hear in the media about uh, uh, something that happened. It says, well, demand was so high that the system crashed. Well, this should never happen. The system should never crash. It should be a nice service, but should never crash. So don't be so excited when uh, you have a marketing campaign and you say, well, yeah, it crashed because we're so successful. Well, it was not designed right if it crashed. Um, and again, can the product, and when, when I use the term product is in generic term, that's a physical product, an application, or a service. Can, can it really scale? And again, what happens when you, um, uh, when you get to a different uh, magnitude? And technical debt. So if you are an investor or a manager in a, in a software company, you just join them. Let's say you join them in the growth phase. The first thing they're going to tell you, you know what? Our software really sucks. We have to rewrite the whole thing. That's what the average engineer will tell you. Because they, write, they like to rewrite it. And it's not ideal. It might be ugly. And frankly, if you go to the best restaurant and you go back in the kitchen, you, you probably don't want to eat after that. So you, so you don't want to see what's happening. But the technical debt don't embark on a big, big uh, project. All rewrite projects, I would say most rewrite projects fail the first time. So if you are told, okay, we, we have to rewrite the system because it really doesn't scale. Our application is very much in demand, but it doesn't scale and we have to do something about it. Uh, don't embark on an all or nothing or a big bang approach, but try to do it gradually. And sometimes it's painful to do it gradually, but that's that's really the right way to do it. Um, process. And, and, and we all heard the term agile. Uh, maybe some of you uh, looked at the Spotify uh, model. They published it. Uh, they have talks about it. And, and, and um, they really made a big contribution to the process. Okay, how do we do this? How do we, how did, suddenly we have 1,500 software developers. How do we organize culturally? And I've seen companies just copying that, that process. In the meantime, Spotify moved on. They changed their process. They found the flaws and they corrected it. 
So be careful uh, about that. The good old project management, whatever method you use, still still is still needed. Uh, don't fall victim to the yeah, but well, we don't need project management. We have sprints that last two weeks. We 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 have uh, stand up uh, meetings early in the morning for 15 minutes, and we know what's going on. And the software will be ready when it's ready. You know, we ask our customers when. Okay, so I'm signal that I have to uh, uh, jump to the. So there's nothing here. Okay, so let's jump to the bottom line. Here's a few things that I want to share with you. And um, if you're going to come out with one thing from this talk is my first bullet. The secret source of our scaling success is people. That's really the difference. And when I look at some of my clients and I have, I, I, I have now my, my three major clients, one of them has 200 people in development, the other one has 50, and the third one is about 45. Uh, and I look at the successful period they went through, the difference is people. So spend the time in hiring the best. Uh, hire the best people you can and invest in developing those people. Really support them. And uh, when you talk about onboarding, uh, onboarding is not just, okay, does a person have a laptop? Do they get their pay? Think of that, get going, but invest in that. If you are a manager, invest the time to coach them, buddy them with somebody. But even senior uh, management, I've seen a lot of senior management, managers, uh, VP of marketing, VP of product management, and so forth, being hired. People that have been very successful somewhere else, and they fail. And, 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 and in my limited experience, I think about half of those transitions from a big company to a smaller company, because where are going to get the experience, don't succeed. And maybe they hang around for a year because it doesn't look great on the resume value after a few months, but they're, they're disappointed. So invest in that. Um, some people will be a real obstacle to growth because they don't enjoy that. Oh, we used to be so efficient. We used to talk every day. We used to work together. And they are really not the right people. So loyalty is great, but don't bet your company on it. Uh, move people to a different role, or uh, ask them to leave and, and, and be successful uh, somewhere else. And again, don't hire people based on smarts. Uh, uh, I, I have, for hiring, I really have three criteria. I want somebody who is smart, nice, and get things done. All of those three are necessary. So don't fall for smart jerks. Um, my next statement might, might seem strange to you, the, and I've seen it a lot, is people that are companies that have initial good success. And success might be for every reason, and it doesn't matter. I will take luck over smarts anytime. So you are successful. Some people like your product. Investors want to put money. And if you are not self-aware, you think you know everything. And you, you come up with ideas. And you, you have seen some people that have been successful solve the company right away. And they moved on and started the incubator because now they know how to do things. And they, uh, uh, they, they have an investment fund. And they're expert. Um, luckily, not all people are like that. So initial success, why well, it's wonderful, and you are on that can be a problem for, uh, for growth. And again, as I said before, don't copy anybody's, anybody's process, because every group needs to develop their, internally their own uh, understanding and, 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 um, uh, and do it gradually. You know, uh, Walk before you run, OK, when you develop new, um, um, you do that. My next statement, I think I repeated that already, is know and be very honest. Be very honest about where you stand, who your people are, etc. And be honest about yourself. I mean, a lot of you entrepreneurs are, some of you, of the people here, are going to be CEOs of, of, of I don't know, a billion dollar company suddenly. And, and be honest about yourself. Know what you don't know. That's um, uh, communication with the team. 
and being transparent is very important. Uh, if you go to people's websites and you see their values, the list of their values, what amazing. Uh, they can be Mother Teresa, that everything, they, they care about people, they care about their customers, etc. And you have to look behind that and see, don't, don't, don't communicate values you really don't believe in because your communication manager has copied it from somewhere else. Be honest. Uh, and don't, don't hesitate to, to admit you are wrong. And, and, and I, one of my, my major clients just did that recently. And I was so proud of him because he was able to stand in front of 200 people and say, we introduced this, pro this uh, new process, we introduced organization, and now we're making a correction. Uh, in this case, he did not believe that the, the, the squads, which are the lowest level of, uh, of uh, organization, of somewhere between five and 10 people, he didn't believe they need a, they need a leader. And, and it was a real disaster. So he changed his mind and promoted and hired leader for those groups. Those are people that are uh, player coach. They, they, they are still individual contributor. But he, he admitted in front of everybody that that was a mistake and corrected it. And people really uh, appreciated that. That's all I have to tell you so far. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much for your presentation, Israel. Um, scaling a business does seem like it's a bit of a, of a dance, maybe a couple steps forward, a couple steps back. Um, and I really sh appreciate just sharing your wisdom on that and the experiences that you've had. Uh, as growth, ultimately, if, if you're moving too quickly or not fast enough, uh, you can find yourself in hot water or freezing. So there definitely seems to be like a lukewarm, medium approach uh, that works best. And uh, yeah, so we're gonna open up to questions now. If, uh, if you have a question, John will walk around with the mic. Uh, let's save storytelling and comments for offline. Israel, will you be hanging out with us a little bit afterwards? Okay, so if you have a story or a comment that you'd like to share with Israel, let's, let's save it for offline. Thanks. I'm, I'm curious for the CEO of a company, how do you balance open-mindedness with single-mindedness? Because if you look at a lot of the real success stories, the, the people at the very top seem to be incredibly single-minded. Uh, that, that's that's really. I, I think I think uh, very successful people are bloody-minded. They have one target and they go after it. The question is that for how many people does it work? And 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 open-mindedness doesn't mean changing your mind all the time. It doesn't mean talking to a thousand people before that. But you build a team, you build a management team, you have your cabinet there, listen to them, okay? I've seen many times where the founder, CEO hired some very experienced people, but didn't change his or her management style at all and continued to, uh, didn't give him autonomy to do things, et cetera. And, uh, but sometimes it works, like bullying sometimes works. We, we know that, we watched your president interact with uh, yeah. uh, uh, the dictator in Korea and might actually work. I don't know. What are we going to say then? Bullying works sometimes, but most of the time it doesn't. Uh, hold on. Got a question back here. What would you say are the major differences between a bootstrapped company and a company that got a major investment right up front? Yeah, that's. Uh, that, 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 that's really uh, a very interesting uh, one. And a bootstrap, uh, you know, uh, people like to use the concept says, well, we, are, we have limited resources, so we cannot do everything we want. So frankly, I wouldn't want to work for a company that has unlimited resources, okay? So I think the same way bootstrap company is a problem because if you don't, cannot make your payroll, if you personally cannot uh, have enough income to survive, it's a big problem. But the other way around, when the company is funded as a pet project of somebody that has lots of money, for example, okay, and 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 to me, a little bit of scarcity is always good. It's good because it forces people to make the right decision. 
but when you talk about a, a bootstrap company, sometimes, uh, uh, a lot of time it doesn't work because people cannot survive long enough to, to get there or get into the company people that otherwise we wouldn't associate with. So I was, uh, I was talking to a, a client in Chicago about a year and a half ago and he told, uh, I asked him, how did you become the CTO? He says, well, nobody was willing to work with them. I was able and willing to work for free for one year. That's my, that was my major qualification. He also happened to be a very good engineer, but sometimes people get stuck with people that otherwise they wouldn't associate with. So obviously bootstrap, I have a lot of respect for people that uh, mortgage their house and, 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 and move into their parents' basement or something like that to, to do that because they are the ones that really make things happen. So there, there, is, there is a difference, but once you get, your, you get to the point where you are even thinking about scaling, it's the same problem. Hi, process question. Have you seen any uh, examples of distributed teams with a successful process where the folks are managing full-time positions themselves and trying to basically all get on the same page in different time zones and have a consistent process within themselves? A little different than scaling, but basically creating that core process. Have you seen any successful examples of that? Um, I think the results are mixed. Personally, I like everybody to be in the same room. And if they cannot be in the same room, the same building. And if they cannot be in the same building, the same city. Uh, I, I, I manage groups everywhere. I had an organization where I had people in uh, Bangalore, India, and in Washington, DC, and in uh, Ukraine, and so forth. I, I think the, the ones that were more successful are the ones that the people in those groups were completely autonomous. So what, what, I, what I don't like is when people say, okay, I'm going to do uh, QA in India because it's less expensive. Um, and and um, when I, one of the two big companies I worked for, I actually moved people around to have complete products. So the interface between uh, the people in different time zones is very narrow and doesn't have to be very often. Uh, I've seen, um, I, I think partially successful when, when you have people that have a, uh, use Scrum for example and have a stand up meeting uh, with people remotely. I, I don't think it works so well. I don't think it's so. So if, if your product or your service can be uh, separated into autonomous groups and you really, what you have is, is not scaling, as you said, but a distributed organization. So they're almost like separate companies. That's the ideal if you have to do it this way. Um, but you know what? I, I personally would rather have fewer people in one location than, uh, Many times we look at outsourcing or uh, remote work in, in lower cost areas, and there is the illusion of savings. So that's my personal opinion. A lot of people believe in that. You know, when I was traveling back and forth to, to Bangalore, India, and, and stopping in uh, Frankfurt and talking to people in the lounge there, and all the very senior managers were very happy. And all the middle managers, people at the director level, were very unhappy. So it, it, it told me something where, uh, you know, you have people that look, you have your CFO look at that and says, oh, what's the hourly wage? Oh, $20 an hour. Fantastic. I want that. You get five instead of one. Well, many times I would rather have one. But that's just my personal opinion. Uh, other, many other people disagree with me. Hi. So when you're talking to a founder, potentially a coaching situation, um, what kind of symptoms are you looking for? You know, if, if you're thinking about scale, how do you know maybe it's too early for this founder or maybe it's too late and you should really go for it? Like what kind of symptoms do you, do you listen for? What kind of metrics in the company are you looking at that would give you that determination? Okay, so um, the, 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 my clients, I would say, are all uh, in a stage where they just got funding. So you have you have, you have founders, and maybe the founders are two or three founders. One of them is a techie, the other one is a business guy, really an ex-salesman, 
and 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 and, and the, the third one is a creative one. Okay, uh, so. Uh, it's very interesting what you ask because I, I'm usually introduced by the venture capital firm and they introduce me and other people for different areas. And I try to understand if they really, they talk to me because they really think they can get help or they do it to please the funder. So I'm looking for self-awareness uh, in, 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 in people that say, okay, I don't know anything about that. I don't know about, can I get help? And what kind of people should I hire? Um, I have I had uh, clients who uh, where I was brought in to help uh, when it was too late, okay? When they really decided, the, the, the investors already decided to fire the CEO. And uh, it's no shame to be fired as a CEO after you found the company. It might be very painful there, but you or one added the value already. So I, I, I'm really looking for self-awareness I'm looking of who is his team? Who are his close associates? Uh, and in one case, the close associate was a, a, a roommate, uh, which is nothing wrong with that, but uh, he did not see, he, he was unable to, to, evaluate, to evaluate that. So I'm looking at, okay, where are we now and how we, how we plan to grow? Some of them, like this, this uh, client in Chicago, uh, very good at sales, he concentrated on what he could do, and he he uh, he was uh, able to hire uh, to to hire people that uh, and gave them the opportunity. I had another client in uh, New Jersey, and uh, she continuously tried to get help, but didn't let them manage. So, if I want to distill it to one thing, it's self-awareness. Uh, all the other metrics, okay. I look at the system, does the system work, what kind of outages, what kind of tests, those things can be fixed, can always be fixed, but not have self-awareness, thinking that you know everything. I personally avoid people like that. I'm in a stage in my life where I work with only with people I like, but uh, uh, I guess you have to work with them sometimes. All right, guys, thanks for the questions.